everyone, welcome to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Baracco Eddy, and with me tonight we have two very special guests, one of whom you've seen with me before, Dr. Roger Orth. He is with the Sacred Heart Division of Gastroenterology Associates, and you can find him at Sacred Heart and the Endoscopy Center on Davis Highway. And our other guest is Dr. Ken Ford. He is the CEO and Director of IHMC, the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition that is here in Pensacola, and they have other locations that he'll tell you about a little bit more as the program goes on. Tonight our topic is Sweet Home Microbiome, and we're going to be doing a lot of discussion about that. Later in the program we'll ask you to give us a call if you have any questions or comments, but for the beginning of the show we've got a lot to say. So Dr. Orth, I'm going to start with you in the you can give us an introduction to the topic and tell us a little bit more about Dr. Ford, and it's so well, great to have you both here. It is a thrill to be here again with you, Angela, but it's even more of a thrill in some ways to be here with Ken, because not only can I be found at uh, the endoscopy center and all those places I go, but often I get a chance to do what I think is one of the more challenging, stimulating things, which is to go down to IHMC and see who Ken's got for another lecturer. And so what we're really doing tonight is we're extending what often occurs at the IHMC lectures, which is that we have lots of nutrition-based dialogue. Real scientists coming in from real faraway places to talk about really smart things. And the nice thing about that is we also, depending on your status, is you get a chance to meet these people, and what a privilege. So I want to tell you that the digestive system is frequently mentioned in the lectureship, and I want all of you to also look at the IHMC uh, statements. And you can see how the lectures do and you can watch them all on YouTube. But you can also imagine sitting down and eating dinner with these people for two and a half hours. What a stimulation. And tonight is a direct extension of the last lecture and we had a, a very nice talk on personal enhancement. And a lot of the things that Ken is involved with has nothing to do with artificial intelligence, nothing to do with robots. It has something to do with improvement of the physical species. Why? Because your government is interested in that. Now you may look over there at that DARPA place, but in reality DARPA helps him a lot with his funding. But so he in turn acts as a negotiator for different things that are needing to be studied for science. And some of it is personal uh, improvement. And one of the things that Ken has sponsored it has something to do with the microbiome. And the microbiome is, this is the gut. When Hippocrates in 460 BC, and I mean that's before Christ, that's a long time ago, and he says all disease begins in the gut. In reality, there's a lot of diseases that are related to the gut. It's not just what you eat and personal habits. Some of this is actually almost like predestination, that you get born, and if you get born a certain way and your parents had a certain kind of biome, you had a better life. And if you didn't, well, that's just too bad. And so I've asked Ken to do a special show with us tonight because Ken is an honest-to-goodness expert. He has spent more time on this subject than I could actually say I even considered doing. I take care of real-time patients who have real problems, real gas. But Ken, he's studying where are we going from here with DARPA, with the military, with real people. And I, I do want to say that there's a range. There's a range in this from what Ken calls the vanity press, and I call also then a, a range of real science, real clinical and real clinical science, which is the kind of thing we learn in med schools and that we learn after med schools. And then what DARPA has done and is doing. And, and these DARPA, for those who don't know, that's a Defense Agency for Research Projects Administration, I guess. And in any event, they are the guys who thought up the internet. They really did do that. And so if they can improve my fecal biome, I'm all over that. Maybe I can lose weight by not dieting, but just anyway. Ken, what, what can you share with us about your special knowledge? Because uh, trust me, he's got a lot of knowledge. You'll be obvious to that. Well, thank you. First of all, Roger, thank you for inviting me to be with you here tonight. Um, my interest in, in the microbiome is mostly involving human performance and resilience. Uh, how can the microbiome be shaped to increase resilience, cognitive performance, 
uh, reduce negative stress responses, and perhaps increase resistance to infection. Those are the kinds of things that, from a Department of Defense issue or perspective, that are really important. And of course, the microbiome connects to many diseases, perhaps, perhaps a dozen. Um, that's not completely clear yet, though many are clear. The, um, you know, we, we all carry around about three and a half pounds of microbes. So each of us have three to four pounds of bugs in our gut. And it may sound like an unlovely idea, but these are uh, essential. And in many ways, most of them are beneficial. And if you think about that, we, we have about 100 times more microbes in our gut and, on our, and in our mouth and on our skin than we have human cells in our body. It's clear that um, we are a complex union of the human and non-human uh, to produce this incredibly flexible creature that we call humans. So now uh, the National Institute of Health has recently spent about $115 million sponsoring research trying to understand uh, the microbiome and the connection between the human genome and the genetic basis for these uh, many millions of creatures that inhabit us. Trillions. Yeah, trillions. Uh, 1,500 species. Because a, a, a probiotic is in the millions. That's but, right. But the microbiome, now that's in the trillions. And it's, it's like the national debt. There's a big <laughs> difference, as Dirksen yeah. said, between a billion <laughs> and a trillion. Yeah. It's really amazing. And, and I'm interested to hear more also about the genetic interaction with the microbiome. I think that that's something fascinating to talk about. Too. Well, I, th I think it's interesting that we have a certain number of genes in our body, but can I think the, the bacteria well overwhelm us by the total host of them? There's, there's 12, 16, 2,000 types of bacteria, and each of them has a genome. And actually, their genomes are very complicated. And so we are the final synthesis. We are sharing a parallel world. And we can't live without germ-free animals don't live. Yeah, it'd be a bad thing. It would be a very bad thing. It's just when the germs get loose, it can be a very bad thing. Mm -hmm. and, and it really comes down to a interesting analogy would be the Great Wall of China, at least when it was built which is that it was a very long but skinny wall, which is be your epithelial cells. And if you were to spread out all the epithelial cells, they're one cell thick. And one cell thick through the entire gut, you've got several hundred square feet or the size of a tennis court in your gut. And everybody who's on the other team has to stay on this side. And everybody who's on our team stays on this side. And somebody opens the door every so often. And it turns out there's a lot of things that manipulate that? What kind of things would manipulate that? Well, the principal door opener is a, a substance, it's a, a paracrine factor called zonulin. And uh, zonulin is produced by the, uh, by the ingestion of glut gluten and the gliadin part of gluten. Uh, and essentially, zonulin opens the tight junctions. And yeah. so uh, the, Roger was talking about keeping the stuff that needs to be in the gut, in the gut, and the stuff that should be outside the gut, outside the gut. And so these junctions are critical. And uh, we know that zonulin is the key. It also influences uh, uh, the brain blood barrier, which as you can imagine is critical. And even in staging diseases like glioblastoma, you see a correlation with zonulin levels in serum. Yeah, I, th I think actually, it it's interesting that one is epithelial and the other is endothelial, but the point is is that those cells have to meet up and then they interface. And when the first application of zonulin occurred less than 10 years ago, then suddenly you had a name for something that we all knew back in med school, which was that you could breastfeed a baby for the first six, nine months and then you would take large proteins in and after that it would close. You would have so-called tight junction. But the tight junction can be opened and later in life. And we've all 
sort of learned that, oh, things come through the cell surface and things come through with little receptors and, and we have enzymes that go out there and digest stuff. But it turns out there are positive and negative features, but the, the junction itself allows the entire organism or pieces of the protein to come in between the cells. They're not coming through the cells. This is a big difference. And so disorders, diseases of aging, diseases of different kinds of problems will turn out to be related to the diet, not just because you overabsorb something through the cell, but maybe, maybe because you had a leak. What, what do you think about, uh, when you think about gliadin, Gliadin is a carbohydrate, so a lot of the lectures, by the way, at IHMC have something to do with carbs because actually I've eaten dinner with Dr. Ford and he doesn't eat many carbs. <laughs> I can speak to that for, yep. and I tried that. It made me testy, by the way. But it makes you smart if you're actually low on the carbs, but and that's really why he's one step up on me, but that's all right. <laughs> but what, what is it about the carbs that you've got going here? Uh, well, in my own, personal life and everybody makes their own decisions and I don't give uh, dietary advice. Um, I, I eat a very low carbohydrate diet mm -hmm. and uh, try to enjoy the benefits of largely being in a state of ketosis, uh, moving out of ketosis uh, and then back in. But I, yeah. most of the time, 70, 80% of the time, I'm in, I'm in ketosis. But the Carbohydrates that we're alluding to on this are not um, just all carbohydrates. We're, we're, he won't necessarily want to have carbohydrates that are simple sugars, but we're talking about carbohydrates that are actually non-digestible uh, glycogliadins. They're in, from bread products. Yeah, uh, in particular, it's the uh, you know gluten is a compound or a composite protein. Uh, you, you know, it's in wheat, it's in, as Roger said, in bread pot products. It's what makes pizza dough stretchy. So, you know, pizza dough is made with high gluten uh, flour, so it can take a shape and hold a shape and rise properly. And uh, gliadin and glutenin are the two storage proteins that make up gluten. So, uh, it's, it's, I, I once saw a funny uh, TV show where the, not a show, but a skit that was on the web. I don't actually even have a TV, but somebody sent me the link. And there was, uh, there, there was this <laughs> reporter and he was going in the crowd in Hollywood. He was in Hollywood, California. And everyone uh, he met, he put a microphone in their face and said, are you gluten free? And everyone, I said, I avoid this stuff like the plague, they said. Then he said, well, what is gluten? And he asked like 50 people and no one had a clue. Right. But they're free of it. But I've, I've, I've thought now with this whole new onset of things that I want to ask patients, are your junctions tight? That's better. You know? But if your tongue junctions, if, if there are certain foods that would make that, one of the lectures, two of the lectures on, on the, at the IHMC have had to do with a change in the, the genome for wheat. How does that work out? You mean the... The actual genome that we, your great-grandparents yeah. had when they made wheat and they came here from Sicily yeah. and they made this incredible bread, but then the, things got changed a bit because of not genetic modification by gene transplant as such, but really by hybridization, right? Right. I mean, they, we designed, as a species, we designed wheat that was is uh, easier to grow and more productive and... Uh, probably less wholesome than the wheat of old. And we're able to do that by evolutionary time scales very quickly. So our environment, the human environment, the agricultural environment and the industrialization of that environment and much else about our environment changes much more quickly than our genome can adapt. And uh, this has caused a lot of problems as you, can, as you understand. But it also is an opportunity in that the microbiome and its genome adapts very quickly. You know, so when we're born, we inherit a human genome from our parents, but we also, if we're lucky, inherit a really robust microbiome from mom during birth. And uh, that microbiome interacts with our genetics in uh, wonderful and complicated ways 
that literally turn on and turn off uh, some of our genes. And there's a lot of them that we all have that we'd rather leave off. And uh, this is an area of great study currently, and it's probably the hottest area in the microbiome is the complex interaction between the genomes. And as Roger said, there are a lot more of them than us. There's about 140-fold more genetic material uh, in the microbiome. You know, if you, if you think about it, humans are uh, incredibly complicated animals, and we are very different from our nearest primate cousins, the chimpanzee. And yet our, our genetic code is almost exactly like the chimpanzee, or 99.5% the same. That small variance can't account for the complexity in the human and the, the difference from the chimpanzee. And it's believed that much of this is accounted for by the microbiome. So it's true what I always tell patients, that the gut is where your soul is, in some ways. Because actually, the brain will sense what's going on in an afferent and an efferent way through the vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. And the vagus nerve is a big nerve. It, it's just about a, the biggest nerve that's coming out of your brain other than your spinal cord. And it will be able to sense what's down there and it'll make changes. And it's probably true that depending on how you eat, you can have a, a more afferently pleasant experiences. And you can have people who have behavioral issues depending on it and maybe someday uh, we'll be able to treat uh, different kind of nervous disorders or autism and things like that with just literally changing their microbiome. I don't want to interrupt. I hate to do that. But it is time for us to take a quick break. So if you would, please stick with us. We've got a lot more discussion on this very interesting topic, sweet home microbiome, as soon as we come back with more health talk. Your word is gastroenterologist. Can I have the definition? A physician who specializes in diseases of the digestive tract. Can you please use that in a sentence? When stomach pain persists, you should see a gastroenterologist. Could you tell me where I could find one? The Endoscopy Center on North Davis Highway has a highly trained staff of 12 gastroenterologists who are ready to serve all of your gastrointestinal needs. G-A-S. Your first date. Your first job interview. Your wedding day, your first baby. The firsts of everything can be scary, but you survive. Your first endoscopy may increase your chances to survive. Colon cancer screenings can save your life. If you won't do it for yourself, do it for the ones who love you. The Endoscopy Center of Pensacola is an ambulatory care center designed with the patient in mind. Conveniently located on North Davis Highway, the center specializes in outpatient endoscopy. This is the direct visualization of the digestive tract with a video camera. Several different types of procedures are performed involving the esophagus, stomach, small intestines, rectum, and colon. All procedures are performed by board-certified gastroenterologists. Ask your doctor about the Endoscopy Center or call 474-8988. Hello and welcome back to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Eddy, and with me tonight are two very special guests, Dr. Roger Orth with the Endoscopy Center and the Sacred Heart Division of Gastroenterology Associates, and Dr. Ken Ford, the CEO and Director of IHMC, the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition here in Pensacola and also in a couple other locations that I said I was going to have us talk about, but we haven't gotten to yet, but we will. Don't, don't fret. We will get there. We were talking before the break about our, the, tonight's topic, sweet home microbiome, and it's a, a very large, grand topic to be discussing in only an hour. But we were um, talking during the break that Dr. Ford wanted to say some things about the human genome specifically. So Dr. Ford, I'm going to turn it back over to you and let you talk about that in a little bit more detail. Okay, what we were discussing on the break is that the human genome is a really relatively simple genome and it's surprising when you think of a complex animal like a human that we should have a simple genome and it's turned out to be one of our big advantages as a species we have a lot of advantages but that's one of them and so we've only got about 25,000 genes and uh, to put that in perspective uh, we would all agree that a worm is a relatively simple animal in comparison to humans but 
Worms have about 95,000 genes on the average. And uh, a, uh, a well-known microbiome researcher, Alicio Fasano, uh, he's up at Harvard now, has a, a wonderful story he told in his recent talk at IHMC. Uh, and basically what he said, he, he said, you know, he said, raise your hand if you're a fisherman. And people raised their hands. You know, this is Pensacola, a lot of hands went up. And he, and he said, you know, when you fish with a worm, the bait is four times more genetically complex than the fisherman. So here we are at near the bottom of the genetic complexity scale, and yet we're very complicated creatures. And the only way that's possible is a sophisticated interaction between the environment and our genome, and the principal transducer of that interaction is the microbiome. And so this is an area that uh, is going to open just many, many doors in medicine and all kinds of other areas. It's, it's interesting that the metabolome, which is the mixture of your metabolism and the, bacteri and the bacteria's metabolism, how it interacts, there's a lot of little bitty pieces that are, have not been felt to be something we could investigate or even that important because the level is so low that it couldn't be that important. Well, it turns out that that's what's so, so remarkable, about, remarkable about it. The paraquin system that he just alluded to is a part of your gut that gives a local signal only very locally. So if you try to measure it in the bloodstream, if you measure it, that means that guy's really got a problem. <laughs> so it, it, when you have things that modulate only on the local level, but it seems to do it in a sort of organized kind of fashion, it turns out that the chemicals that the bacteria make, which are really interesting chemicals, they have aerial uh, fatty acids and different kinds of short proteins that can modulate the cells themselves, they modulate the actual uh, absorption component, they modulate who lives there. When you mess with your microbiome, then you are looking for trouble. And that's what happens when we mess with it with too many antibiotics. And over the years, I, I have just been amazed at how it's evolved just in my short 31 career years here in Pensacola, how things actually changed. And we recognize that you'd find these people with resistant MRSA out of, who had nothing to do with the hospital and now resistant C. diff who have nothing to do with the hospital. It's because someone's been messing with that microbiome. And when you mess with it, then those little feedback chemicals are no longer there to help keep you on the right side of the wall, the Great Wall of China, or the Great Epithelial Wall. And so then you have this mixing, and you get what they call disease. And, and it's, it's remarkable. There's going to be a, a whole host of things that are evolving that are actually companies that I'm seeing as I reviewed the little things for this talk that have to do with people who are looking for the small next best thing, which will be small sort of localized antibiotics that you don't actually have to make a brand new antibiotic. Remember, most of our antibiotics actually come from bacteria and fungi and, and different small organisms, and we ripped it off. We ripped it off of some Amazon forest. Well, who do you think was making it in the Amazon forest? It was those little bitty guys that we're messing with. And now we're using them to our advantage, but actually, in some ways, penicillin has helped us, but in some ways, it, it has changed. And it may have changed. The microbiome may have something to do with why we have so much obesity, so much fatty liver, so much lots of things. Wouldn't you agree with that? Absolutely. It, and that's emerging more and more. Yeah. And that's why the military is interested. And I'll tell you, if DARPA is interested, I'm interested. Because <laughs> if I could, you know, not just show self-control around a cracker or bread, but actually find some way to modulate my microbiome. Now, there are, it worries me a little bit about people modulating the microbiome. The, this fellow Davies who's up there in Vanderbilt, and he has come up with the satiety factors. And there, our gut has certain satiety factors that says, you are full. So he takes this E. coli, and he splices it in, and he gives it to the overfed mice, and then lo and behold, the, it takes hold in the microbiome of the mouse, and son of a gun, this mouse will lose weight, but that one won't if he doesn't have it. That's right. But it makes me a little nervous because 
it's genies get out of bottles sometimes, and I'm not yeah. sure that's the best choice. Uh, how do you, what do you, is the DARPA interested in that stuff? I don't no. know. I don't think no, so. You know, the, if you really let somebody manipulate your microbiome, you could make them fat, crazy. You know, you could affect a lot. Right. And um, so I have a very knowledgeable patient. I want to give him a plug here because he stimulates me so much because he has this very interesting problem with gas, but it's only gas at high altitudes because he flies back and forth to Africa and Dubai. So you know who you are. And in any event, we have tried manipulating him. I've talked to astronauts and admirals and people who are test pilots and even Dr. Ken Ford about his particular microbiome. He has actually gone off and had his microbiome tested by Larry Smarr, who I'm gonna to get to his lecture in just a minute, but who was here at the IHMC and is the guy who does the whole genomics thing. And son of a gun, if he hasn't come up with this notion that he's gonna to go to the new clinics that are in England and get himself for only 9,000 euros, you can get a certain number of treatments, which are actually inoculations of your microbiome with somebody else's microbiome, which is otherwise, I'm not gonna use that normal <laughs> word for that. Or actually for 12,000 euros, and then, by the way, a euro is different than a dollar, so this is starting to be real money. Less and but, less different. Yes, yes, but he, he's going to make this commute on the way to Dubai to actually pick it up. And I warn him, you don't know who you're picking it up from, and it's not because he might have hepatitis B, hepatitis C, hepatitis whatever. It's because those bacteria may determine what happens to him uh, 20 years later with atherosclerosis or obesity or uh, dementia or other things. Wouldn't you agree that's possible? Absolutely. Uh, they've even seen, you know, profound behavioral changes. And, uh, you know, uh, there's, a, there's people sort of joking, should these kind of transplants only come from very well-adjusted, happy, intelligent people? And how would you know that? You know, they've, uh, they've done this kind of thing in a very focused way with mice and have been able to make a mouse not afraid of cats just by manipulating the microbiome. Yeah. And so the mouse walks up to the cat and rubs itself on the cat, and of course the cat leaps back, you know, Rrr! the cat thinks I've, I've met an insane mouse, right? And, uh, yeah. and then very quickly the mouse is dead. But the, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you can imagine that you can change the behavior of the animal with, you know, it's got, we've got 100 million neurons in our gut if you can change the brain behavior of an animal by messing with the microbiome, that's pretty profound. And, and it actually, that goes back to the zonulin component because the epithelial cell of the gut has the same kind of c control factors as the endothelial cell of the blood-brain barrier. And so leakages and ways that things leak into one thing, mm. if you have a person with pancreatitis, it turns yeah. out you can find out all these endotoxins, etc., in the bloodstream, but how'd they get there? They, they got there because there was a, a, a release of zonulin and you ended up having a leakage. But when it circulates around, things will get up into the brain situation. Now in everyday homeostasis, it's possible that behavioral issues are not just things that get into the gut and then go blindly wherever they want, but it's actually semi-selective because it's, or selective, it's going to the epithelial cells that involve the same system in the brain. And I would postulate that the reason that glioblastoma falls into this category is because that's a remarkably invasive, I don't know your actual limits kind of tumor, and it's gonna release it because they don't know who they are. A cell like that has lost all of its surface characteristics and is a really nasty kind of tumor. Absolutely, I and mean, there are zonulin receptors even in neural tissue. So uh, right. zonulin's an interesting Interesting. And it has a neat thing. name, and, and they're going to have an actual blood test for it. And I can see that it'll be like gliadin antibodies for gluten, but it'll yeah. be actually a very common test and may actually be of some utility. It because be. in having watched many talks down at IHMC and in dinner with these guys, it's apparent to me that the wheat sensitivity is more than just people with celiac disease, which right. is one or two million people, but in reality, it's our population. And that as I try to manipulate people's microbiome. I do it not as much with probiotics or antibiotics as, although I must admit sometimes it's the cheap, easy approach to give them an antibiotic, but I try to do it with a, a prebiotic, which is actually a prebiotic meaning that you're, you're taking 
something that has a nutritional component that changes your microbiome. Mm -hmm. Food for the bugs. Food for the bugs. And it's, it's very interesting. In our country, too, now, we're getting collection sites and people for donors, and they're trying to characterize the ratio of the many types of more common ones. And it's very interesting that some people are characterizing getting the patterns of if you're a vegetarian and a vegetarian in Malibu, it'll be different than if you actually eat over here at one of our places in Pensacola, because we have a different dietary background. It'll change your bacteria. This is an issue for uh, the Department of Defense, and particularly for rapid deploying troops, uh, especially special ops folks, is, uh, you know, you're moving around the world on very short time scales and picking up different uh, additives to their microbiome. Well, and I'll take it one step further, having sat in on a number of the IHMC night talks, is I want you to mention a little bit of what our military is feeding our guys in Afghanistan or in Iraq. Because somebody outsourced the entire food supply in these big bases, which are behind big walls where they don't let them go out and mix, and they're feeding them. What are they feeding them? Fast foods. Generally. And do we have potentially more post-traumatic stress disease than we ever had in other wars, not because this is a worse war, but because we're feeding them a completely different diet. I want to talk about that in more detail when we come back, but it is time for us to take another quick break. So please stay with us. We'll get right back to that topic when we come back with more Health Talk. Your first date, your first job interview, your wedding day, your first baby, the firsts of everything can be scary, but you survive. Your first endoscopy may increase your chances to survive. Colon cancer screenings can save your life. If you won't do it for yourself, do it for the ones who love you. The Endoscopy Center of Pensacola is an ambulatory care center designed with the patient in mind. Conveniently located on North Davis Highway, the center specializes in outpatient endoscopy. This is the direct visualization of the digestive tract with a video camera. Several different types of procedures are performed involving the esophagus, stomach, small intestines, rectum, and colon. All procedures are performed by board-certified gastroenterologists. Ask your doctor about the Endoscopy Center or call 474-8988. Your word is polyp. Can I have the definition? A growth or tumor protruding from the mucous lining of an organ. Okay, can you use it in a sentence? If you have a polyp, you should have it removed by a gastroenterologist. Could you tell me where I could find one? The Endoscopy Center on North Davis Highway has a highly trained staff of 12 gastroenterologists who are ready to serve all of your gastrointestinal needs. P-O-L... One. Hello and welcome back to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Eddy, and with me is Dr. Roger Orth with the Endoscopy Center and the Sacred Heart Division of Gastroenterology Associates, as well as Dr. Ken Ford with IHMC. We are talking tonight about sweet home microbiome, and we've been talking about all the bugs and good ones and bad ones that are in your gut, that are on your body, that are part of who you are, that make you who you are. And we're learning more and more about how they make you who you are. Before the break, we were talking about the diet of our soldiers that are overseas. And we were talking about the prevalence of PTSD. And, and Dr. Ford, um, during the break, you said something that was very interesting. And I want you to repeat that for everyone about the PTSD and the diet. Well, I was saying that diet doesn't cause this, but a unhealthy diet can certainly make a person more susceptible and, and less resilient. Really, the word is resilience. That's what, that's what you want to see in a warfighter, and that's what you want to see in everyone. And uh, an appropriate diet and the appropriate uh, lifestyle helps make a person more resilient. So that's an important thing for us to keep in mind, and not just with the soldiers overseas, but um, Dr. Orth, you were talking about how DARPA is interested in that and, and the different outsourcing that they're doing for the soldiers. And Dr. Ford, you were saying how it's important as the soldiers are being deployed very quickly, what they're eating and, and how that's interacting with where they're going. Well, one of the reasons why the Department of Defense is studying the microbiome isn't uh, just to try to shape it for improved performance or 
more resilience, but also to try to understand best how to accommodate the changes to the microbiome that occur with travel three quarters of the way around the world, eating very different food, food that's sourced differently, uh, just interacting with the place you are, you pick up uh, changes in the microbiome. And uh, th you know, this, this causes challenges. And there are there's whole sets of challenges for particular kinds of soldiers, both based on the duty they have, gender, quite a few other things. So an ops guy who's out there in the middle of nowhere and is exposed to the actual environment is actually eating a completely different right. than the, the fast food group I was talking about. That's right. Because there's, the, we're talking also especially to a, a friend of ours tonight who's here in spirit but watching on the net and he was recently overseas and he's having a little trouble sleeping and so we want to encourage him that things will re-equilibrate when his microbiome comes back because he didn't get any fast food when he was over there. Um, so About how long, and I don't know if you can even say, does it take a microbiome to kind of recalibrate if you move to a different place, if you're in a different location, and how long does that take? Uh, my, my impression is that it takes a month or three that you would get to a real equilibrium, but this is back into the vanity science thing, and I just, I can't resist bathroom humor because that's really the kind of work I do. Dr. Ford does real science. But there's this guy, his name is Leach, and he is out there and he's been down in Tanzania and he decided he wanted to find the most primitive gut flora in the world. So he did hunt it up and these are hunter-gatherers in Tanzania, probably the most primitive society. He started hanging out with them and then he's doing all these tests on the, on the fecal material of himself when he was eating there with them. And then he's seeing how his fecal biome changed after a month or so there. And then he singled out one particular guy who he looked, must have looked very virile to him or something. And so then they tested him for all the usual things that you might get in Africa, like HIV and Ebola and, and this and that. <laughs> and then he's got himself a turkey baster and needless to say, the inoculum was not per os, per oral, but per rectum. And he's been turkey basing himself. And so what we have is a fringe science that's parallel world of our real science. And that's why I want to bring in a real scientist like Dr. Ford, because people like me like this bathroom humor. But let's get back to regular science for a minute. <laughs> Again, Dr. Ford's <laughs> lecture series, and if you can watch them all, if you just go to IHMC and look for Pensacola lectures. But one of my most interesting visits was with Larry Smar. He comes in and he's the guy who does the genomics thing. And so genomics, when you see how are they testing, and this is really where it's gonna go. You're gonna have your own company. And I have patients, more than one, who go and send their stool in and have it genomically tested so they can see what's in their fecal flora so they can then modulate their diet or modulate you know, what their outcome would be. So this is becoming a more and more common sense, common source process. But Dr. Smart, who's running the UCSD Supercomputer Center, was here in Pensacola and came to the GI lab, by the way, over at the Endoscopy Center, which is sponsoring your talk tonight. <laughs> but when he came, he's the guy who has come up with a way of doing mass analysis of DNA. And that's why he knows all these other geeks in the country, because he's got the supercomputer that can analyze that. Because this takes a lot of computing time. But when Dr. Smar was here, he had analyzed his own gut. And he found out that he didn't have the right gut flora. And so he started doing tests on himself, and it turned out he had a sick gut. And when he has a sick gut, he made a 3D printer. And if Dr. Ford has several 3D printers at his place, and he has not volunteered to use it with anything I can think of yet <laughs> for us. But for him, he's using it. But anyway, Dr. Smart, if you'll watch the lecture that's on IHMC, you'll get a special treat because he holds up this interesting model because he 3D printed it and it was of the, his own gut. And it shows a very diseased gut. His biome yeah. is totally messed up. So I thought, I will bring in my, my own model that I use all the time with our patients and that is our microbiome-containing colon. 
Yes, we usually are talking about colon cancer and other very important features, but we use this in a serious fashion in the sort of semi-scientific world. What do you think, Ken? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in this end, out that end. Oh, that's it. It is, it is a problem, and it goes in this end and comes out that end. Yeah, and that's what... And that turkey got. basting doesn't make sense to me. Does yeah. that make sense to you? Uh, well... Uh, no, I didn't think so. You, 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 you know what the uh, tribesmen must think of this guy. Well, of you course. Know, you want to do what? <laughs> you have a turkey baster. And, and yeah. all I want to know is, did he yeah. reuse it on a turkey or not? Oh, uh, he, he used it originally on a turkey. <laughs> How do you know he's not just reusing it? Anyway, yeah. these are issues that will evolve, and you'll see it in the lay press, or you'll go down to Publix, and it'll right be there at the checkout line in the National Enquirer, but that's not the science we're talking about. We're talking about real science with real diseases and you can that get are real important. some dangerous situations when people start trying to manipulate the microbiome themselves, correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, when they start taking things, when they start doing procedures like that on themselves, when they start taking medications, things like that, to try and manipulate the flora and fauna within their own microbiome, it can get bad. Oh, the flora and the fauna are rampant. But, you know, this country is actually sponsoring a remarkable list of biome projects. I just have them, just part of these are in the sort of semi-lay press. We have the American Gut who's mapping the whole population of the gut with the flora and then storing it in God knows what freezer. The Earth Microbiome Project, that sounds very earthy, and it must be somewhere outside of California. <laughs> the Hadzabi Hunter-Gatherer Tribe in Tanzania. We got the Human Food Project, which determines what food you eat and then what your microbiome looks like. We got, the, this is important because it's a real med school, Cornell is mapping the New York Subway Project which is called PathMap, and you can look it up, but you can find all the bacteria that they find in all the guts, uh, in all the subway system, and you can see that the bacteria move in different nodes and they're concentrated in the busiest subway stations. How amazing. But they, uh, probably DARPA may be interested in that because they're always looking at people who might be bringing anthrax or some other thing into the subway system, but they're doing a net subway genome and now we have the collection centers, and I've actually had somebody who recently requested if I could find out where are our collection centers for a company called Biome. So I'm just making a, a semi-list here of what's going real time, but not necessarily science time. Things are evolving. Absolutely. So it's getting interesting though, isn't it, Ken? Fascinating. It's one of the hottest and most interesting parts of, uh, I think, of science right now is the microbiome and its epigenetic interactions with the human genome. So what do you mean by epigenetic? That was, oh, by the way, that was one of our recent talks, wasn't it? We've had several talks that touched on epigenetics, and epigenetics is uh, epi meaning above, and so it's about how the environmental factors influence the genome. And I mentioned this gentleman earlier, Alicio Fasano, who's spoken a couple times at IHMC, he has a wonderful analogy where he describes our genome that each of us carry around with us as a piano with 25,000 keys. And uh, each of our pianos are defective in various ways. No one has a perfect piano, right? So uh, we all carry some keys some that play notes that we'd rather not hear. And obviously I'm making an analogy to, to the genes that we don't want to Express, see expressed. And uh, epigenetics is about how the environmental factors turn those genes on and off. So if, um, you know, it might take 300 notes to play the song Alzheimer's disease. Well, that's a song I'm not eager to hear. And uh, it looks like environmental factors, in particular the microbiome, plays the role of piano player. And uh, so you can have a piano with notes you don't want to hear. As long as you don't play those notes, that's okay. And uh, if you think about the impact of this, you know, it used to be that we were the prisoners of our genome. So 20 or 30 years, less than 20 or 30 years ago, people thought that uh, your fate was determined when you knew what your genome was. And now we know that's not the case. We know that genetics, to some extent, loads the gun but the environment pulls the trigger. And perhaps the strongest transducer of the environment to our genome 
is the microbiome. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little concerned about people manipulating the microbiome to fix an event that's here, and it turns out it's in the global situation. There's a lot of other things going on. Uh, the, there's a technique called CRISPR, uh, which is incredible, and it's going to allow you to fix the genetic diseases that we always thought in school that were just not fixable, because you can actually get into the smaller parts and do single sets of genes at a time. But when you start to really get into it, you, this kind of manipulation is going to be very beneficial for some, but it's not necessarily going to be the best thing. Well, cr the CRISPR techniques have recently been used in, uh, in a, a different country in a way that's gendered a huge amount of controversy. And um, it's, uh, it's an area of some concern and debate of, of uh, about editing the human germline, you know, and, uh, is that something we should even be doing? Yeah, I mean, just because you can remove the tendency for baldness, would you really give that up if you could? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, we have had such fun with this. I, and why do we have this much fun together? Because Ken's doing these science things. It's like, it's like well, I had a Mr. Scientist teacher in high school for physics and he did Friday afternoon science lectures and I wanted to take a second to just talk a little bit about IHMC some of the things Ken's up to because he's got a lot more than seven foot robots that look like something out of you know the older 60s movies he's but you're starting to think about doing some more outreach things aren't you podcasts yes. and mm -hmm. things we do a lot of outreach but we're expanding our outreach efforts the lecture series is part of our outreach program our science saturdays program with children is part of the outreach program uh, and now we're in the process of developing a new uh, high quality podcast uh, about science and technology uh, this this podcast will be called the most interesting people in the world like the dos Equis beer ad of science and technology. And um, so I'm, uh, I'm in charge of a double secret committee to select who those people are. And uh, we've notified the inaugural group and we've commenced interviews. And, double uh, secret. Double Ooh. secret. Because uh, I don't want any influence on this committee. And I'm, of course, uninfluenceable. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and so this is going to be fun. Uh, the hosts will be Will Robb and Don Kernagas. Ah. And uh, Don's a scientist and Will is a journalist. And I think it'll make a very lively right. conversation with some of the world's most famous scientists. That's great. And right here in Pensacola. And, and it, what it's been fun t tonight is I, I don't always see Ken out there talking to Pensacola. And I'm glad to have him come out of his cubby. And he <laughs> even has... You could even play it over to Nancy's here, his <laughs> wife. And so this, they're sort of a unit, and, and they're commensal. commensal <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to have to interrupt one more time. It is time for our final break. Again, please stay with us. We'll be back with a lot more very interesting discussion as soon as we come back with more Health Talk. The Endoscopy Center of Pensacola is an ambulatory care center designed with the patient in mind. Conveniently located on North Davis Highway, the center specializes in outpatient endoscopy. This is the direct visualization of the digestive tract with a video camera. Several different types of procedures are performed involving the esophagus, stomach, small intestines, rectum, and colon. All procedures are performed by board-certified gastroenterologists. Ask your doctor about the Endoscopy Center or call 474-8988. Your word is endoscopy. Can I have the definition, please? Endoscopy, a visual examination of the interior organs by use of an endoscope. Can you use that in a sentence? An endoscopy is a life-saving procedure that can detect the early signs of colon cancer. Well, can you tell me where to get one done? The Endoscopy Center on North Davis Highway has a highly trained staff of 12 gastroenterologists who are ready to serve all of your gastrointestinal needs. E N. Your first date, your first job interview, your wedding day, your first baby. The firsts of everything can be scary, but you survive. Your first endoscopy may increase your chances to survive. Colon cancer screenings can save your life. If you won't do it for yourself, do it 
for the ones who love you. Hello and welcome back to Health Talk. I'm Angela Eddy and with me tonight are Dr. Roger Orth and Dr. Ken Ford. We've been having a very interesting discussion about your sweet home microbiome. And we have said that if uh, there's anyone that wants to give us a call, we would love to take a, a call or two in our last segment here and give you some time to talk with Dr. Orth or with Dr. Ford again about your microbiome. Who knows what questions you may come up with, but uh, if you have something you'd like to discuss, this is the time. The numbers will be on the screen on the screen throughout the rest of the program, 432-7768, or if you're outside of the Pensacola area, 1-800-950-2522. And Dr. Orth, before the break, you were talking about some of the new upcoming things that are going on with IHMC, and you were asking Dr. Orth well, about I've, some of that. Uh, you know, I'm just listening to what he does all the time. I don't know how he keeps up with it, but I know he doesn't sleep much because he emails me all the time at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> And I go, oh, Ken's up. And so obviously the, he's got a microbiome that has no circadian rhythm. Um, but one of the things that is a bit troublesome to me is that we have this really fun lecture series that you get to go and see all those people come and all the gray hairs and blue hairs and smart hairs of everybody comes and enjoys this really moment. It's really a, a really adult moment. And, we were, they were going to double the size of their, of their speaking area, but because of this flood and because of the f fact that they actually have to raise the building because nobody in the city actually fixed the flood situation, it cost them another extra million. And so I'm here to tell you guys, from the smallest guys to the people who own this station, where's the million bucks so we can get this, this thing bigger? really bigger, so we can go back to being a bigger thing so we have enough room so people don't have to sit in the next room. But what a disappointment that we're not having a bigger building. Yeah, I'm very disappointed about that. And uh, we intended to double the size of the community hall. And the community hall is where the lectures are, it's where the outreach programs and the children's programs are. And um, as anybody knows who's been to one of the lectures, uh, they're standing room only and half the people, roughly half, have to watch it in a different room on TV. And uh, that's really not the same as being in the main room. And so we had planned to double the size of that. And as a consequence of the flooding problems and the lack of drainage, uh, we've had to raise the new building that we're building. And uh, redesigning it and raising it has a substantial cost associated with it and that's eaten the resources that I was going to use for the, uh, the expanded community room. Yeah, because he's not for profit, but of course he could actually sell these little microbiome capsules. <laughs> no, never mind. But anyway, this is someone's chance to actually yeah. talk to Dr. Orth and Dr. Ford yes. in consult because we have a real call. We're going to take a call. We absolutely do. Hello, and thank you so much for calling. Do you have a quick question or comment for Dr. Orth or Dr. Ford? Oh, yes. Go ahead. I am a senior, senior, senior citizen. I already see Dr. Finelli there. I've been so interested in doc hearing Dr. Orth and now Dr. Ford. What do you have to tell someone in her late 70s what I, sh what I could do? Um, okay, when I say that, I, I don't have the internet. What's available for me? I love lectures, but not too late at night. Sacred Heart is the perfect place. But anyway, I'll get off the phone. I need help. <laughs> Thank you so much for your call. That's very good, and we'll answer it right now. Yeah. Thank you. Well, first off, the late 70s is now the late 50s. So <laughs> not you've, senior, you've got senior, plenty, senior. Ahead, plenty of time ahead of you. And what you're really saying is, what is it? That you can do to interface and I'll have to tell you it isn't going to cost you very much but I gave my mother a iPad mm. and I'll have to tell you for limited costs my mother is watching this lecture my mother is how old are your mom 88 87 whatever it is she's watching it on the net she spends hours every day on this iPad get yourself an iPad it won't cost you that much to do it and before you know it 
you will be back in and be, and people that you never even knew were calling you up and sending you messages. But that, that turns out to be a, a feature that older people can use. And for their own information, you can look up and see if we're telling a fib. Or you can look up and say, oh, well, I think this is such and such. And you can watch the lectures on the iPad. And uh, my mom uh, loves her iPad, and she uses it to do FaceTime with the grandkids. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so she holds it up in front of her face, and the grandkids can see her, and she can see them on the screen. Yeah, this is yeah, probably uh, nice. it's a remarkable yeah, device from the standpoint of consumerism, but it's it's a really great resource for an older person. Yeah. And I would encourage you to just find some way to not get something else, but get that. Because that's a really great intellectual thing for you at this point in life. I think so. And I'm yeah. sure that you could call the IHMC also and they could give you the upcoming lecture series dates and times mm -hmm. and things like that. So that's you can right. always give the IHMC a call and they can certainly help you with that as well. But this show will be rerun a number of times this month and you can tell your friends. That's right. And of course, we are always looking for new people and Dr. Finelli will will definitely look forward to helping you further. Absolutely. We don't have a whole lot of time. I know that there's a call that's been coming in. Uh, they haven't thrown it to us yet. But if you're the one that's calling and we don't have time to get to your call, we apologize and we'll try and get you after the show. So oh, please, please, please hand. stay with us and we'll try and get you on in just a minute. Well, Thank you all so much. This is down us. at the Endoscopy Center if anyone wants to come and see him. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Orth. Dr. Thank you, Ford. Dr. Ford, for okay. coming. We appreciate it so much that you would take the time. And Nancy for coming with What you. an honor. Uh, thank you thank to have you. There might be a microbiome problem <laughs> over here. Uh <-huh. laughs> and thank you so much. We'll see you next time with more Health Talk.